Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, October 30th, 2022. We are still in Unit 2 in the Faith, with Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, which is entitled Out of Slavery to Nationhood. This is Deacon Barry Taylor. Uh, our lesson title, this is lesson number nine, is The Heart of a Leader. The Heart of a Leader, our devotional reading, is taken from Acts chapter 13, verses 21 to 31. Background scripture, which is also our printed passage or lesson text, is 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. Our key verse from the King James Version is verse uh, 7 16 chapter 16 verse 7 the Lord said unto Samuel look not on his countenance or on his height or his stature because I have refused him for the Lord seeth not as man seeth for man looketh on the outward appearance but the Lord looketh on the heart our lesson aims or number one Compare humans' standards of choosing a leader with God's standards. Number two, value living with a heart that is pleasing to God. And then number three, practice living with a heart that is pleasing to God. After the introduction, our lesson has two divisions. The first is entitled... It's a matter of the heart. That's covered between 1 Samuel 16, 1 and 7. 1 to 7. And the second is listening to God's voice. That's covered between 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 8 to 13. Now, uh, before we get into a little background, let's go before the throne. Our Father, we do thank and praise you. Lord, for another opportunity to study your precious word. Uh, Lord, we know this is a historical narrative, but as always, Lord, we can learn something about your character, about your wisdom, about uh, how we can direct our lives uh, in ways that are pleasing in your sight, Lord, uh, even in historical narratives such as this passage today. We thank you, Lord. Uh, that uh, uh, by the, the understanding of your word, uh, our faith and our obedience uh, will be increased. And we just ask, Lord, that you would give us the understanding, the clear understanding that you would have us to have of this word today. We ask your blessings upon each and every one uh, that's hearing my voice in the households they represent. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, last week, if you recall, uh, our lesson uh, involved uh, Israel uh, desiring a king like the other nations uh, because Saul was getting old and they're concerned that he was getting old and his sons didn't walk after his way. They were very corrupt and didn't walk after his way. So they desired a king and the Lord told Samuel, uh, they are not rejecting you, but they're rejecting me. Give them a king. And of course, the Lord through Samuel uh, selected a king that was of their liking. Uh, he looked kingly. He was tall by head and shoulders above, taller rather, by head and shoulders above all the other people. So they judged basically on his appearance uh, that this man was going to be a good king and one that would represent them well, that would go out and come in as other kings, that is to battle and be a good warrior. And uh, they had all these um, aspirations, if you will, for this king. However, God knew his heart then as he does um, all of our hearts. And as uh, things unfolded, he became uh, 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 unsuitable, if you will, disobedient and proud and uh and so god rejected him uh, as king uh, and he uh, told him through samuel that his line would not continue but he would choose someone else 
anyway so our lesson picks up uh, but, but before we get into uh, the background more specifically uh, we know that the heart is used throughout the Bible and in our common uh, everyday uh, language uh, metaphorically we know that the, the heart organ what it does the vital part it has uh, in our lives it pumps oxygenated oxygenated blood through all the organs in the body and it keeps us alive but metaphorically the Lord uh, the, the heart rather has been uh, uh, inter has been uh, representing all kinds of of uh, things if you will it represents our feelings the seat of our emotions it represents uh, our compassion it represents uh, our conscience our intentions our purpose it represents a number of things uh, but uh, when when the Lord refers to the heart he is speaking of the core of our being, of our very being, um, and what the what we really are, if you will. So, as we will learn in our lesson today, uh, God looks beyond the outward appearance, as we cannot do uh, too uh, successfully all the time. We can sometimes look beyond appearance and see characteristics that are either favorable or unfavorable in, 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 in to God. Uh, but we cannot always, we can be deceived by appearances, but God looks beyond appearances to the very core of our being. So with that, we are, uh, our lesson after the, as I said, uh, uh, last week uh, we left off again with the uh, selection of Saul as king uh, and uh, what through his disobedience uh, and his pride, uh, the Lord, because of those things, I should say, the Lord has rejected him from a, 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 from a, a continual reign through a dynasty uh, up, uh, over his people. And we can read about uh, Saul's downward spiral and his, uh, his failure and final rejection by God. In, in chapters 13, 1 Samuel chapters uh, 13 to 15. But uh, the, our commentator says here that, uh, that God's expectation uh, is that those who serve and worship him must have hearts that are rightly related to him. In other words, our core being must be rightly related to him not just uh, our outward works or uh, even our words uh, from god's perspective it reads the heart of the believer is what he observes and evaluates that is god god looks behind every smile and action and assesses the heart's sincerity therefore when god chooses leaders for his people his primary concern is their hearts. Uh, God's choice of David as Israel's second and greatest king is an example of this truth. Now, for those of you who also use the standard commentary, uh, the lesson title is David anointed as king. Uh, additional aims very briefly are this, number one, describe the selection process of David as king. Number two, compare and contrast that process with that of the choosing of Saul as king. And then number three, write a prayer asking God for a clean heart and eyes of faith. And one of the things I hope we, uh, we get as a result of this lesson is an understanding of how important our heart condition is uh, before the Lord. I mean, we we obviously uh, uh, can't bear our hearts entirely to uh, others, other humans, but God knows uh, everything that there is to know about our heart. In other words, our core being, and uh, we want to have pure hearts. Uh, we we think of Matthew 13, where the Lord talks about the four types of hearts. Uh, 
and the, and of course the most important of which is uh, the one that has good soil uh, that receives the seed that is God's word and produces much fruit in our lives that uh, bring praise and glory to God. So we're going to read our first um, passage. Again, the first division is entitled, It's a Matter of the Heart. And I will read from the NIV and then we'll back up. We will have some verse by verse discussion. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn? And I'm reading again uh, verses 1 through 7 of Second Samuel chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil, and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 3, Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Verse 6. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart, the heart or the core being of each person. So we're going to back up to verse 1, which reads, The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? That's part A of one. So Samuel is mourning. Uh, why do you suppose Samuel is mourning? And one of the commentators I use, uh, John MacArthur, says he is mourning as a person would mourn for a dead person. Um, and I... Uh, believe that uh, Samuel certainly had great hopes for that Saul would be successful in leading God's people uh, and being obedient and, and being directed by God but Samuel proved uh, to be again proud and disobedient and we can go back and read specific details as to how he demonstrated that so while Samuel had uh, the appearance that was attractive to the people, um, uh, they could not discern uh, his heart, the condition of his heart, neither could Samuel. And this is something we need to understand, and God is giving Samuel a great lesson. Samuel uh, had hopes and thought he might be a great king leading uh, Israel uh, to, uh, in their uh, obedience and, 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 and maintaining obedience uh, to the Lord but uh, that was the shortcoming of Samuel as well as the people because they could not uh, have predicted what his character would be like and we know ultimately or later on uh, after David is anointed king uh, we see Saul's real character when he is uh, uh, after David uh, in pursuit of David to destroy him so that he would not uh, fulfill God's will in succeeding him as king. So part B reads, he says, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Now, um, 
Horns, of course, were used um, uh, as trumpets to sound alarm and uh, and to uh, to sound uh, the times of assembly uh, or battle. But they were also good containers uh, of oil, and uh, especially when sealed. And uh, so, this um, uh, was a was a common. Uh, container for traveling for carrying liquids when traveling and so the lord tells him to fill his horn with oil the oil of course is going to be used for anointing we'll talk more about that when we get further into the lesson he said he's sending him to bethlehem we know that bethlehem is the how means the house of bread and to jesse who is the grandson of uh, boaz boaz and ruth his father was Obit, their son. And now Saul is coming from, or will be coming from, Ramah, which is, and there's several Ramahs that distinguish this one. Uh, it was about 20 miles from Bethlehem, which is where uh, Saul resided. And that's all God told Samuel. Fill your horn with oil, go to Bethlehem, I'm going to choose one of Jesse's sons and that was all Saul needed to know at that time however Saul was a little apprehensive about uh, taking this mission and so we read in verse 2 2 a well let's read all of 2 he said but Samuel said how can I go if Saul hears about it he will kill me that's part a let's this let's, let's, let's deal with that for just a minute so you know if Saul makes an unexpected trip uh, even 20 miles and he's will we, we, we may not realize it but he's actually going to go through uh, the hometown of Saul uh, Gibeah or Gib Gibeah which is the hometown of Saul uh, he might there's some 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 suspicion uh, might arise as to where he's going and for what purpose so uh, and and we know that at this time, um, and back in chapter 15, uh, Saul has told, I'm sorry, yeah, Saul has told Samuel that the Lord has rejected him and that uh, he was not going to continue his his line uh, 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 as 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 uh, king uh, king of of kings rather, if you will, of Israel. So he's concerned about this. And it's a natural concern, a natural fear. Uh, part B says, the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Now, um, this was not unusual. It was uh, fairly common for the prophets to travel uh, to make sacrifices here and there. And typically this would have been a peace offering uh, what's a little different is that uh, it was a heifer, which was a, a young uh, female uh, calf or calf, or uh, and typically the uh, the offering would have been a male uh, a bull or bullock, and uh, in this case, the the more important thing was since it was a peace offering, it could be either. And the more important thing that it be without blemish without any blemish so he is taking this uh, heifer to bethlehem some 20 miles to offer a sacrifice now and all he had to do if someone questioned questioned him as to why was to say the lord directed me to do this which would be absolutely true right okay verse three the lord continues invite jesse to the sacrifice <laughs> And I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. So Saul is to go to Bethlehem. He's to announce, I'm offering a sacrifice to the Lord. And he was to invite among others, and especially the men, I, I imagine maybe but, uh, exclusively the men, Jesse and his sons, okay, which is implied. Verse 4, Samuel did what the Lord said. 
and that's that's important and I love to read um, God giving clear direction to a prophet or to any individual in the Bible that they did it and they did it without hesitation uh, in many cases so that, there's no indication that Samuel hesitated at all it simply said Samuel did what the Lord said when he arrived at Bethlehem the elders of the town trembled when they met him they asked do you come in peace the King James says peaceably and why would that be well, um, it, 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 very often <laughs> prophets came with judgments, with dire warnings of judgments or with judgments. We, we read that throughout the Old Testament. Uh, many of the prophets uh, God used to warn Israel of their continual sins or continual practice of sinning, uh, including and most notably, idolatry. Now, these men had to question themselves, most likely. Here's a holy man coming. What have we done? You know, like a, like a child when a parent suddenly appears out of nowhere. They, they want to know if they're into something they shouldn't be into. And so, uh, these men. Uh, and as you you recall, when the Lord uh, uh, performed a miracle uh, before Peter and John and and and, and having them haul in the uh, this, this great uh, when he was calling them as disciples when he had uh, maybe it was Peter and Andrew I don't remember right now but had them pull in this great haul of fish after they'd been fishing all night uh, Peter realized that he was in the presence of a very holy man and he said depart from me for I am a sinful man it's that same type of uh, impression or feeling that these men get here, here comes the holy man of God and they, so they begin to examine themselves to see if they've committed some sin for which he is going to pronounce judgment. So they ask, are you coming in peace? And what does he say? In verse 5, Samuel, Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I'm coming peaceably. And this, this peace that's used here is not, uh, it doesn't mean just the absence of violence, but it means a, 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 a soundness, a wholeness. Uh, of well-being uh, it's not again it's not just the absence of violence so he's coming on a good mission if you will um, verse uh, <clears throat> verse 5b says I have come to sacrifice to the Lord consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Now, what what is he asking them to do and asking them, the men uh, to consecrate themselves? And then he made sure that Jesse and his sons were consecrated and invited them to the sacrifice. Well, first of all, there, there was a ceremonial consecration. They could not have... Uh, touched any dead body or dead thing. Uh, they could not have, uh, in some cases, maybe had sex with their their wives uh, immediately before. Uh, uh, they were washed. They, they would wash themselves and their clothing. That was a practical cleaning, cleaning before coming to the sacrifice. So they would take some time and consecrate themselves. Uh, and I would I would say spiritually uh, hopefully they had any distracting distressful thoughts uh, cleared from their minds as I believe we should do uh, uh, whenever we partake of the Lord's Supper if anything we're to look and examine ourselves and to make sure that uh, we have no unconfessed sins uh, when we partake of the Lord's Supper we can sanctify ourselves uh, spiritually before doing so Verse 6, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before us. Now, what is that all about? Well, Samuel has the same problem that most of us have, and that is 
looks at the outward and makes uh, a prejudgment, okay, based on appearance only, because Samuel could not have known anything about Eliab. But he said, Sh and said to himself, no, nah, he didn't say this out loud. He said it in his heart, surely this is the guy, you know, because he, as we learn uh, here shortly, he's tall, uh, he's uh, physique, he's got a nice physique, and no, no doubt handsome, and he looks kingly. And that was, of course, uh, what the uh, Israelites were attracted to in Saul. Uh, but we go on here, and um, and verse 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance, okay, or his height. Evidently he was tall, for I have rejected him. Now, the Lord rejected him, and he's going he's gonna to say for what reason here in a minute. But uh, he's telling Saul something that all of us should heed. Do not look on the appearance of a person and make judgments about the character of a person. Uh, we read in Isaiah uh, 53 that, uh, that the Lord was, was, was not comely. He was not something uh, beautiful to look upon. And, and it's not clear as to, to me whether certainly... Uh, he he was uh, uh, beaten to a pulp and certainly uh, uh, and, and looked horrible then. But even even before then, it doesn't suggest that he was uh, suggest that he was not a, a handsome necessarily man, but a common man. So he says, uh, let's go on. He says, people look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And all of us are guilty of this. Let's not presume that we're not. Uh, we make judgments about whether a person would be good at this or that and in this position or that position without knowing much about the person or the person's character. But the Lord looks at the core being. Again, the heart is the core being of a person, the essence of that person. Uh, he called the Lord, uh, I'm sorry, David later as we get uh, further into uh, the second Samuel, actually a man after his own heart. And we know that um, David sinned. I mean, David sinned, but David confessed his sin. And uh, the whole tenor of his life was obedience to God, even though he stumbled. You know, and the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Though he stumble, he will not be utterly cast down. And we know because of his sin, the Lord did judge him and not allowing the sword to depart from his house. But uh, he looked, as we'll see here in a minute, uh, beyond uh, appearance at his heart and selected him on that basis. We'll say something about his appearance as well as we get into the next division. And there is a question here at the end of uh, this first division. Can you recall being disappointed because you selected some something or someone based on appearance um, probably so I can't recall anything at the moment but a lot of times people choose uh, mates or people choose uh, partners uh, in this or that because of a person's appearance and it asks also what did you do differently the next time you needed to make a choice? Well, I would say if you made a, a quick decision based on appearance, uh, the next time you had to make such a decision uh, uh, concerning a person, let's say, for a position, whatever, uh, you took some time to investigate the character of that person or to learn more about the character of that person. So let's move into our second division, which is entitled listening to God's voice and that's covered between 1 Samuel chapter 16 verses 8 to 13. I'm going to read the passage from the NIV and then we'll back up and have some verse by verse discussion. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Saul but Samuel said the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. 
just yet seven of his sons passed before the Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Verse 12. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him and uh, in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah, or returned to Ramah. So let's back up to verse 8 again. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Uh, obviously, the Lord looked beyond his appearance and saw something in his character that made him unsuitable to be king over his people and the others. Verse 9, Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said the same. He said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse had, verse 10, seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen thee. So the Lord looked beyond the appearance of the seven, the first seven sons, and they were probably passed before Samuel in order of their ages. Uh, and the Lord saw some character flaw or some reason that he thought they were all unsuitable uh, to serve as king over his people. Now, for those uh, serious Bible students out there, you might have noticed verse 10 says he made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And of course, ultimately he calls David. David would have made an eighth son. If you recall from 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verses 13 to 15, it said that David... I mean that um, Jesse had seven sons. They actually named them. Only seven sons uh, of Jesse or named and two daughters. Well, what happened to the eighth? Uh, it's the, the likeliest explanation, the commentator of the standard commentator um, explains is uh, that one of the sons uh, may have died before reaching adulthood. And uh, because a genealogical document, documented lineage, especially from father to son, uh, because that was a very important, a son who died before marrying and without heirs might not have been named. So one of the sons that was previously listed of that seven uh, may have died uh, before marrying and having heirs, and therefore, first crime. That's a little little bit of tidbit there. We don't, you know, we just um, don't want to be confused when there seem to be inconsistencies uh, in Bible texts. Um, so, so let's go on. So, verse eleven reads. So we asked Jesse, "Are these all the sons you have?" There is still the youngest. Jesse answered, he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send him, send for him rather. We will not sit down until he arrives. Now, uh, it is probably pretty obvious why the youngest was not there. Okay, number one, Jesse. Uh, Jesse himself uh, showing a little prejudice there thought there's no way he's going to be and he was probably the runt of the litter if you will at that point he was probably 14 or so and he was probably smaller in stature than the other uh and of course somebody had to contend the sheep while the others uh, consecrated themselves and went to the sacrifice so the youngest got the duty of of tending the sheep 
and um, it says, uh, well, Samuel says, send for him, you know, and, and I don't know how urgently uh, he was fetched, if you will. I think the King James says fetch. Um, but he, um, uh, he might have come directly to the place of the sacrifice, uh, unwashed, in which case he smelled like the sheep, you know, and this is, this is really something that the older brothers are all clean, uh, washed and with their clean clothes on and so forth. And all of them have been passed over. And here comes this ruddy, uh, King James calls him the ruddy, uh, boy, uh, perhaps unwashed if he didn't have time to wash and change smelling like sheep, right? And, and Samuel says, we're not going to sit down, uh, before he comes. What, what did he mean by that? Sit down to eat the sacrifice. Okay. It was customary, uh, to sit, uh, to sit and eat, uh, what was not actually offered in sacrifice to the Lord. And so of the offering. Now we know, um, the Lord through David uses the symbology of, uh, a shepherd, a shepherd, uh, as uh, uh, one the, the 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 type of person he wanted to govern his people, to shepherd, if you will, his people. Uh, we know uh, David was inspired to write Psalm twenty three, uh, comparing, uh, really symbolizing the Lord as a shepherd of his people. Well, the Lord wanted the king to be. Uh, uh, a replica, actually, uh, imitate him in shepherding his his people, Israel. But let's not let's not let's not get any uh, grandiose uh, ideas of uh, what shepherding was like. It was it was not a glamorous job. It was a a lowly job. It was a, a stinky job, and uh, but. It was one that had to be done, and uh, good shepherds uh, guided the sheep and protected the sheep as the Lord intended for the leader of his people to do. Verse 11b, so he asked, no, I'm sorry, um, verse 12, we're down to verse 12 now. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. Now, so again, we don't know how urgently uh, he was fetched or how urgently uh, David got there. Hopefully he had time to wash and change, but assuming he didn't, didn't matter. Okay, it didn't matter. He was there, and it's interesting that the Bible further describes him, or describes him rather, as glowing with health. King James says he was ruddy, which means he was he was reddish, either in complexion or hair or both. Uh, he had a fine appearance and handsome features. Now you say, well, wait a minute now. I thought appearances weren't supposed to matter at all. Why are we told that David was handsome and, and uh, had the handsome features and fine appearance? Well, let, let's understand something. Let's be clear on something. You know, th th there's no uh, godliness uh, necessarily, or no more godliness or purity of character in ugly people as there are handsome people, okay? Uh, and we want to make that clear. God doesn't look on the appearance. The appearance was not what uh, was not the reason that God selected David. It was because the heart, his his uh, his the core of his being, that God was able to see beyond his appearance. But it doesn't matter whether a person is handsome or ugly. God looks on the heart, and it just so happened that David was a handsome young man, but that was not the base. We want to be clear on that. That was not the basis uh, of God's decision or God's selection of him. Because we can see people that maybe even handicap people and think that God has judged them 
uh, for some reason, as you remember, Jesus' disciples asked about a certain uh, a blind man or handicapped man. Well, who, who, who sinned, this man or his parents? And, and Jesus said, neither one of them sinned. But uh, this happened for the glory of God. And so we, we, we don't want to uh, prejudge based on appearance one way or the other to think that because a person is not attractive that they're cursed by God or that they've committed some sin or their parents committed some sin uh, or, or if they're handsome that they've been blessed in other ways beside with their attractiveness uh, but again God always looks on the heart or the character or the core being of a person and he says uh so the Lord tells uh, Samuel, arise and anoint him. Well, what, what was this anointing all about? At this point, uh, priests and prophets were anointed. Um, I think Saul was the first, well, he was the first king. The anointing was a, uh, a, a symbolic act of empowering uh, a person of God's choosing to perform the duty that God chose them to perform. So when he poured the oil over his head, and more than likely it was olive oil, it was a symbolic um, empowering of David uh, with whatever abilities he needed to perform the duties that God was calling him to perform as king. And verse 13 says, so David, I'm sorry, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. Now, you can imagine what the brothers thought. I mean, it may, whether he's stinky or not from being rushed there from, the, from keeping the sheep or whether he's had a chance to clean up or not, they are probably extremely jealous and envious. And... Uh, and we later, we just as an aside, <clears throat> we later learn about the character of some of the other brothers and, and perhaps why God did not choose them. Uh, the first son that was called, which again, Samuel was quick to say, this surely this is God's anointed, right? This, that was, uh, uh, Abinadab, Abinadab. Okay, well, well, when David uh, came to the battlefield where Israel had been uh, confronted by and uh, teased by or taunted, if you will, for 40 days by Goliath, Abinadab, none of his br brothers that were old enough to go to, to war, uh, volunteered to go out and fight Goliath. In fact, Abinadab teased David for being there. And, uh, of course... At, so at this point, so that was part of what God knew already. He didn't he, he didn't have the courage that David had, nor did the others, as I said, that were old enough to uh, uh, to be uh, soldiers at that point. Uh, but uh, but there's nothing mentioned. I don't want to take that too far because there's nothing mentioned about the brother's reaction there. But what happens after that? He says. From that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Now, Samuel anointed David with oil, again, s symbolizing the empowerment of David to perform God's will as king over his people. The Lord himself anointed him with the Holy Spirit, powerfully, it said. And we know all of the Psalms and uh, we know God, the wisdom that God gave uh, David to reign uh, throughout his life bespeaks uh, this empowerment uh, of the Holy Spirit. And we know even that penitential Psalm, Psalm 41, we says, take not your spirit from me, you know. And we know that uh, we are, we Christians are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's taken up residence in us. Uh, in the old, during the old before Christ, uh, the Spirit came upon uh, those God chose to do uh, certain work and empowered them uh, for the time that they needed to perform the work. Even Samson, you know, when Samson performed those great feats of strength, 
the Spirit of the Lord came upon him at those times to enable him to do that. Uh, but we know the Spirit would depart or could would depart uh, from uh, those that were used in the Old Testament. But David was, uh, I guess, as con continuously indwelt by the Holy Spirit of those uh, of any of those uh, in the Old Testament used of God. Uh, but we're not not to say that he he took up permanent residence in him, but we know that. He was empowered, he was anointed powerfully by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God was uh, directing him in a, in a strong uh, uh, resource, if you will, or source of power throughout his life. Now, not to say that he could not sin, we know that he did, but the Spirit directed and empowered him uh, most of his life. So having said that, uh, David... I'm sorry, Samuel went back to Ramah, and we presume in peace, uh, uh, that, that's, that's what that's all about, telling us that Samuel got back without arising this, uh, arousing, if you will, the suspicion of, of Saul, and it had accomplished what God intended for him to accomplish in anointing the next king. Now, we know what happens, those of you who read through uh, Samuel and then further into 1 Kings, uh, what happens afterwards, uh, Saul, of course, uh, eventually does learn uh, of this, uh, that David has been chosen to succeed him, uh, and he becomes his arch enemy. He tries to destroy him, and we know that David uh, ran uh, from Saul for years. Eventually, he became king of Judah at Hebron, uh, and he was a king. At, this is after Saul's death, after Saul was killed in battle. Uh, and then uh, he was there for seven years and then king of all Israel in Jerusalem uh, for 33 years. So he reigned for some 40 years. Uh, now, the takeaway, main takeaway from this lesson is that we are not to judge on appearance. We are not to uh, select, if you will, leaders based on their appearance based on our uh, and, and and when i say appearance not just physical appearance if they have some natural abilities if they speak well uh, if they have good management skills we're not to just look at those things when it comes to spiritual leadership but we're to look at the character we're to look at how devoted they are to the things of god and how led they are by the spirit of god so I hope that we've learned a little more from uh, this historical narrative uh, than perhaps we knew before. And we'll just close out in prayer here. Father, we do thank and praise you again for, uh, Lord, this lesson. We we thank you for those who, uh, who've listened. And we hope, Lord, that we have learned a little more about what you intend, intended for us to know about uh, your vision, Lord, and as compared to ours, Lord, and how we, we ought to try to have uh, the, 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 the vision that you have being guided by your spirit, of course, Lord, in our selection of spiritual leaders, Lord. Uh, we just thank you, Lord, for those that you have placed uh, in leadership uh, of us, Lord, who, who have been empowered by your spirit and who are walking in your way, Lord, doing those things that are pleasing in your sight. We ask, Lord, that you continue to bless us with such leaders, Lord, and that you would raise up even more. Amen.